This is Professor Want, and today we are here to discuss forensic hardware, specifically the type of forensic hardware a digital forensic expert would use in analyzing or uh, dealing with certain digital media uh, in order to help with an investigation. Uh, student learning objectives for uh, this podcast are for you to understand the specific need for dedicated forensic hardware, why we must use special equipment, why you cannot just use standard uh, computer hardware to do these analyses, and for you to at least uh, have a basic understanding of the different categories of forensic hardware and forensic devices that are available on the market. Before uh, listening to this podcast, you as the student should have already listened to uh, two podcasts, the first of which being on uh, the digital forensic forensic expert and the second one being on file storage. So we're, we're still discussing who are these digital forensic experts. Um, they are normally surrounded in mystery. Many of us don't know much about them from our daily street life, uh, from TV or movies. Uh, the digital forensic expert still is kind of a mystery. So let's try to fill in the type of equipment a digital forensic expert would use to do his job. So when we talk about forensic hardware, digital forensic hardware, we're basically talking about it could be any hardware that is specifically engineered uh, to be used in the gathering preservation analysis of digital evidence. Um, some hardware will only do one step, other hardware could do every step, uh, but the important thing to remember is that we do use specifically dedicated hardware um, for use in digital evidence cases. And that uh, hardware, um, law enforcement and investigative personnel are trained um, on those specific hardware, uh, either by the hardware manufacturer or by third-party programs. Um, very often, uh, certain digital forensic experts will be certified or will be um, in service on a very specific piece of forensic hardware, and they will have some sort of certification or certificate showing that they've completed a training on that specific hardware. But why do we need forensic hardware? Why can't we just use a laptop or a Dell or a Mac? Or a, Why do we need dedicated equipment? And, and the answer is fairly straightforward. Uh, we have numerous different types of forensic equipment um, to ensure sure uh, data integrity. Uh, these pieces of hardware and the data that we retrieve um, and our case overall against a defendant or a suspect or in a, in a corporate case, maybe a corporate espionage case, our cases need to have a certain level of legitimacy. We have to be able to keep certain chains of evidence. We need to know what the software is doing to the evidence that we're analyzing. So we take all these safeguards to preserve data integrity and to take pr protective measures to make sure that our work at the end uh, is not only admittable uh, in court, uh, but is of the highest possible quality and standard. Overall, there are five types of uh, forensic computing hardware, uh, five different categories um, that we want to uh, discuss with you. Um, these are very loose categories, and many pieces of hardware fit into multiple categories. Um, but ultimately, we have forensic computers. Um, uh, some forensic computers, like a FRED unit, uh, might have the ability to do uh, an entire forensic investigation, uh, but they're large, they're big, um, and sometimes you have to get them out into the field. Um, write blocking devices, um, what a write blocking device will do uh, is allow you to access or, or look at a hard drive without worrying about changing anything on that hard drive. If you pop a hard drive into a standard computer and start looking at it, um, even if you're not doing anything, just if you're looking, changes are being made to that hard drive, which could jeopardize the integrity of the data, or at least what you what you say happened. Um, so a write blocking device, um, which is the standard, would prevent us from making any changes to that hard drive or to that data while we're looking at it. Imaging devices are important. We'll get into those in a second. Um, let's say we're going into a situation where there are multiple computers being used that we need to analyze. We don't. We, we might not be able to take them all with us, um, or we might have a lot of hard drives, and we might meet, uh, we will probably need to make copies of them before we do anything to them. Uh, we'll get into imaging devices, uh, data wiping devices. Um, so now that we're done with our project, now that we've proven what we've proven, now that we have gotten our case uh, finalized and all of our evidence is logged and preserved, how do we make sure that the next case doesn't get 
infected or contaminated by our previous case. How do we prove that the case, the information for case two was not affected by the information from case one? Well, we wipe the devices in specific ways. Uh, data wiping could be done not only to secure the data, uh, but to secure your integrity as well. And finally, we have encryption hardware. Um, encryption hardware could either encrypt or decrypt. Um, there are several um, pieces of encryption hardware out on the market that are made available by, let's say, Microsoft or Apple, uh, and we'll talk about those in a minute. So let's start with forensic computers, uh, uh, the first out of the five categories. Forensic computers uh, are, again, dedicated computers uh, that are built for capturing and analyzing data from specific devices. Um, it could be a hard drive, a cell phone, a flash drive. Uh, it could be anything digital. Sometimes we, we might take a, uh, a cus a um, off-the-shelf computer like a Mac Pro um, or a Dell, install special software on it and make it a dedicated uh, hardware, a dedicated forensic computer. Other times, um, you, we will have dedicated computers that are built and that live at our digital labs that never leave our digital labs. They may be large towers, you know, three feet high, two, two three feet high. Um, and these dedicated computers, such as our forensic ev evidence recovery computers, um, don't leave the lab. Uh, they don't have any other purposes, and they're all about forensic an uh, analytics. Um, if you're looking at this slide right now, um, you'll see two examples. The first one up top is a dedicated MacBook Pro uh, that has um, hardware and software interfaced into it to be able to do iPhone uh, analysis and analytic. The kit below it is actually a fairly common kit. That's one of the older ones. They're cell phone interrogation kit. Um, and what these allow you to do is interrogate a cell phone, uh, which is another way of saying analyze a cell phone, to be able to determine um, not only uh, what the person has done on the cell phone, it allows you to recover all the deleted text messages and pictures and emails per se, uh, possibly. Um, you can get a lot of information off of a cell phone and um, these dedicated cell phone analytic kits are really important. So we've already talked about the fact that data integrity is the number one priority for digital forensics. Uh, we have to prevent contamination. So uh, as we discussed earlier, write blocking devices are uh, in incredibly important. Write blocking devices prevent you from writing to a hard drive that you're currently reading from. Uh, as I discussed on a previous slide, um, just by reading from a hard drive, you will make some changes to it. So we use write blocking devices. Some of them are built into dedicated forensic computers and others are separate. We use write blocking devices to be able to um, uh, analyze digital media. Uh, it doesn't have to be a hard drive. It could be a flash drive or a SIM card or a flash, um, a, a SD card from a camera or internal memory in a product. But what we don't want to do is change what's on there. So we use a write blocking device in one way, shape, or form. Then we have imaging devices. Um, imaging devices um, could be built within a forensic computer or they could be standalone models as you see here. Imaging devices almost always contain write blocking technology. Again, we don't want to contaminate the data. And um, the idea of an imaging device is to make an exact complete copy of one hard drive onto another. You make a bit for bit copy of the exact data on one hard drive for another. And we call these a one to one copy. Um, it's written as one colon one, but it's pronounced one to one copy. And the reason why it's called the one to one copy is obvious. Uh, it is because um, we're making an exact copy of that data. And we do it uh, in order to protect digital integrity. Uh, if we're doing an, an analysis or if we're moving forward, why work on the original drive, the only real original evidence? Why work on that? We shouldn't be. So let's make an exact copy using proven best practices and let's work on that copied drive or copied media instead. So w there are lots of reasons that we would want to use data wiping devices um, in technology. Um, one reason might be to uh, erase our own sensitive data, either personal, government, or corporate. Um, we all know at this point that by deleting a file, you don't delete the file. You just delete the path to the file and the record of that file, but the file is still on the hard drive. Um, so what a data wiping device would allow us to do is to completely wipe the data off of a hard drive and make it almost like new again. Um, they're important for both information security reasons to protect yourself and for digital forensic reasons. At the termination of our investigation, we really need to show, um, and we have to have a record that this was done, that we've destroyed the copies of the evidence and we've reset a lot of our equipment back to the original setting so that there's no contamination from one investigation into another. You need to remember that digital forensic experts 
experts aren't just looking at files. They could be looking at individual bits, bytes, or information on a hard drive. So what we need to do is make sure that there's nothing left over on any of this equipment when you go to the next investigation. We also need to discuss encryption and encryption hardware. Now, there is a separate podcast on encryption uh, that you should listen to because encryption in itself is a lesson. However, what we need to realize is that encryption could be either software or hardware based and hardware encryption at times is is very widely deployed in the government and commercial world. Um, So we know that encryption uh, protects our data, our sensitive data, by changing it um, using an algorithm so that only we could understand it. Uh, But what's important to remember is that when it comes to encryption hardware, usually the digital forensic expert will be able to get into the encrypted data in one of a few different ways. Um, And listen to the encryption lecture to to, to understand how to break encryptions. But what you really need to realize is that the couple ways in um, are really only by a a brute force or dictionary-based attack. We are guessing the key, and those could take years or months or even um, centuries to do, depending on the type of encryption that's used. But one of the other options that's available to us, and we need to remember that it it's a viable option is to approach the corporation or the company or the software or hardware developer to see if they have a back door into that encryption. Um, now, many play, many many um, software developers, such as Microsoft, um, give law enforcement tools to be able to get through some of their encryption. Um, so we want to check on that. If you if a digital forensic expert goes into a facility that has some dedicated hardware encryption, um, they shouldn't just throw up their hands and say, "Hey, I'll never be able." to analyze this stuff, uh, they need to really check with the, um, the the manufacturer of the equipment to see if any backdoor access has been left. If no backdoor access has been left, then it might be very hard to get access to that data, and you might have to do a brute force or dictionary-based attack or, or one of another type of attack to get to it. We use, we use encryption to protect our, our most sensitive evidence, um, and we need to remember that while doing digital forensic uh, recovery or analysis, we might have to not only decrypt but also encrypt crypt as well. Um, and that's something that we need to remember. So we, we just looked at some real corporate uh, level uh, encryption hardware, but we need to remember that there's also a lot of personal or smaller encryption hardware that can travel with people uh, on their on their persons. Um, the most famous and the most uh, well noted is the iron key. Um, I would suggest that uh, after this podcast is over, you Google iron key, just throw iron key into Google and you could start getting information on it. Iron key is a company that makes military grade flash drives um, that they claim um, if set up correct are unpenetrable even by them at times. Uh, It is set up extremely interesting. Um, There are different types of iron keys out there. There are personal iron keys um, that only I would have an encryption to or there are enterprise level uh, iron keys where you can issue out iron keys to your employees where they can have their own codes but then you can have an enterprise uh, key to get through their encryption if you need to as well. So remember, you know, if you find an encrypted iron key, um, one, obviously, you'd be contacting iron key. There may be a way in or not, but also you might want to um, look at the corporation itself because they might also have another key to get in without the individual's password. But iron key isn't the only personal encryption hardware out there. There are lots of them. Um, Lots of SanDisk USB flash drives use this U3 technology that encrypts right on the the, the flash drive. And sometimes it's hardware-based, sometimes it's software base it depends on what model you have but what there is what, what what's important to remember is that encryption hardware um, the ability for people to be able to use encryption um, is doubling or tripling um, you know every few every year or so I mean, that number is uh, there's no evidence on that number that number is something that I'm just coming up with right now on my own um, but when you really look at the market and you look at how easy it is for people personal people to use encryption that's hardware based um, it, it, it's it's a field that's exploding. Um, the iPhone, for example, uh, is currently being redesigned to allow encryption-based hardware um, so that when you give away your iPhone or sell it, all you have to do is to delete one encryption key and you don't have to worry about clearing out the whole phone, for example. Uh, but there are a lot of different types of encryption and what you need to, what the digital forensic expert needs to remember is they are likely to find encrypted information um, and then it is a challenge decrypting it from there.